Proponents of intelligent design often put forward an argument that was first put forward by William Paley, an English clergyman, called the watchmaker analogy. But suppose walking along through the wood you found this. Now, if you'd never seen a watch before, it would be very hard to imagine that this had appeared there just by chance. In this analogy, Paley said, if you happen to be walking in an open field and you stumbled upon a watch, if you picked it up, you could see that it had intelligence in it and that hinted at a designer. Such complexity couldn't come about on just on its own. Compare that to say if you picked up a rock in the same field, it clearly doesn't need much of a design. But a watch shows purpose and it shows design decisions. Therefore Paley argued that it's much like the eye. The eye shows intent and it shows that someone has made design decisions. Therefore, there must be an intelligent designer to make those intelligent decisions. But living things were even stronger evidence of a great designer, Paley said. If you looked at something like the human eye, how could you believe that such a delicate, complex and ingenious organ could come about purely by chance? Now this argument goes back to René Descartes and Newton, much further than just Darwin. And what they argued was that the laws they discovered in nature, the natural laws, showed such perfection that they resembled something like the clockwork mechanism of a watch. And therefore there must be a watchmaker. And that watchmaker, of course, was the pers personal god, the metaphysical presence of the deity that created all these laws and sculpted organisms to perfection. But Paley went on to say that because they had been created by God, all living things were by definition perfect and would never need to change. Now how should we answer the teleological argument for an intelligent designer that there's actually purpose in say the eye uh, that the eye is designed to see and therefore the mechanism shows that somebody understood the principles of optics and created an organic organ that could actually see and focus. Well, Something that's not often raised but I'd like to point out is that if you happen to literally come across a watch like Paley's in a field uh, in an alien say environment on another planet, say, and, and you had to decide whether this was constructed by some beings or not. If you put it under a microscope, what you'd notice that from the molecular layer, as you went up to bigger and bigger components, till eventually you got to, say, the jewels and the watch, the cogs, you would find that there were discontinuities. What I mean by that is if you take the structure of the metal, you'll find a crystalline lattice. and at some point, you'll have evidence of machining. You'll, you'll have evidence that somebody imposed with a machine tool top down something unnatural where the, uh, the lattice was never going to go. It's sculpted. So you would see clearly that there was a top down imposition of a, de of a design that wasn't natural for the bottom up construction of the crystal lattice in, inside its components. And so that clear shear face or discontinuity where you can see things have been tooled and machined gives you an idea that somebody was making basically unilateral design choices in these machine components. Now that doesn't happen in nature. If you go down to the biomolecules, then everything that happens is scaled up from there. There's no discontinuity. That's where the chasm of understanding is. You've got this really stochastic looking process, the, the building of proteins and then them sloshing around in solution. And then on the other end, you've got the organism, which seems really directed, really deliberate, like, you know, five fingers go on the end of this thing, five fingers go on the end of this thing. How do you get from these molecules and proteins moving around in solution to some kind of meaningful structure? And it turns out that the way viruses reproduce is a really good example of how meaningful structure can arise from molecules swimming around in solution. 
if you pump out enough of them, eventually 12 will bump into each other and form a capsid. A meaningful structure arising from a random process. So the eyeball doesn't have design choices. Nothing is imposed on the biochemicals and the cell structure underneath. You can clearly see that nobody machined an eye from the top down. It emerged from the bottom up all the way from the DNA molecule. That means that even if there was an intelligent designer, he doesn't have free reign. He can't make absolute choices like, say, a machinist can make when sculpting metal or machining it. Now, I think that's a very strong argument to say that that's why a watch shows evidence of design. You can see somebody making design choices that run contrary to the grain of the actual materials. Now, that's not true with biomolecules and organisms in nature. They emerge bottom up, all, all the way up from the biochemistry and ultimately from the DNA. And the DNA and all the structures, the cell structures, is all to do with not design choices, but imposed choices, mostly imposed by things like the least energy configuration or pursuit of Gibbs free energy. So even God doesn't have design choices. And here's the really clever part. These viral proteins are just floating around aimlessly in solution, but they've been built in just such a way that when they bump into each other, they snap together and they snap together at just the right angle. In some ways, it's a bit like a triangle. You might say, well, a triangle is a brilliant design because on a flat surface, all triangles have internal angles that add up to 180 degrees. That's brilliant. So there must be a brilliant designer behind it. But of course, there's no design choice in that. Even God can't draw a triangle that has anything other than internal angles of 180 degrees. And biochemistry is a lot like that. If you scale it up from the physics of how a molecule forms and the least energy states and configurations that it assumes, then an organism scales up from there seamlessly. There's no point where you can say, aha, here somebody clearly imposed a design choice from the top down on the structure below it. When considering forced laws in biology, it's worth mentioning Kleiber's law, which Max Kleiber discovered in the 1930s. OK, so he plotted the mass against the metabolic rate of, of all the animals. So mouse, elephant, blue whale, there was also mayflies in there. And as you might expect, with the bigger animals, they need more energy to survive. And that's what metabol metabolic rate essentially measures. How much energy do you need to survive? And this scale crosses all sizes of animals, right down to cells, all the way up to the blue whale. It's amazing how this curve describes all the animals. Max found was that this curve is that the metabolic rate is proportional to the mass to power three quarters. Although it gets complicated for plants, as you can see here, Kleiber's law is stunningly consistent for animals. I think if Darwin had have known about it, he probably would have shelled his theory, or at least thought about it for a decade or two more. It can also hardly be mere chance that the human body goes to an inordinate amount of trouble to maintain a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. The most likely reason for that is that's the sweet spot in temperature where most biochemical reactions occur. But what has that got to do with competition and the Darwinian evolutionary mechanism? Bear in mind that famous champions of evolution like Stephen Jay Gould insisted that evolution was a completely underacted drunkard's walk and could wind up anywhere. He ignored allometric guardrails like Kleiber's law, animal symmetry and animal geometry, let alone how viruses are constructed. Darwin knew from talking to breeders and from doing his own breeding that organisms were not randomly and infinitely malleable. Artificial breeding was often quite elastic. In his theory, he seems to have deliberately ignored the fact that breeding had limits. As artificial breeders know, you can only breed a characteristic just so far and no further before the creature becomes unviable. And when breeders relax their selection criteria, the animal often mysteriously reverts back to its original type. There are strong hints that organisms have preferred stable configurations, and they can evolve their way back to find them elastically, 
without the aid of Darwinian competition. According to most neo-Darwinists, if time were rewound then evolution would never play out the same way twice. I presume they also think that if mathematics and geometry were invented all over again they would be unrecognisable from the mathematics we know today. You may well say such mathematical and biochemical laws are just the organism's environment, but such abstractions are certainly not what Darwin assumed the environment to be. And where's the all-important competition? According to the Darwinian delusion, then the reason that the Nautilus's shell conforms to a perfect logarithmic spiral is because the specimens that don't adhere strictly to phi or the Fibonacci constant are weeded out because they are less fit. I guess some pedantic mathematics loving predator just comes along and vacuums up all the nonconformists. Oh no. Ideal proportion. Not quite. Uh uh. No, I'm afraid not. Well, we can't all be mathematically perfect. Oh yeah? Yeah, I do want to do it. I think that anyone who tries to argue that organisms are in competition with each other to see which can best adhere to the fundamentals like Kleiber's law is on a fool's errand. What next? Organisms are in competition to see who can best obey the laws of gravity? If anything, I think Darwin's theory of competition tries to explain the opposite. Essentially why organisms evolved to defy natural laws like gravity, rather than to conform to them. Where am I? Mathematic land. Mathematic land? Never heard of it. It's the land of great adventure. You might have noticed that the virus has icosahedral symmetry or dodecahedral symmetry. It has 12 identical faces like this. And that's really common for viruses. And the brilliant thing is the RNA of the virus only needs to code for this one single protein. In the words of Galileo, mathematics is the alphabet with which God has written the universe. Now this argument against Paley's watch is actually quite a strong argument against Darwinian evolution too. If even a supreme being can't sculpt things from the top down, then how does the environment pull off the same trick? Darwinists have always answered this question by saying that it happens very gradually, as if you can cheat gradually, you just can't make great leaps. Dickie Dawkins wrote to books about the subject. One was called Climbing Mount Improbable and the other was The Blind Watchmaker which was about Paley's watch. In Climbing Mount Improbable Dawkins pushes Darwinian gradualism. Gradualism was always a pillar of Darwinism. Yet the theory of evolution says that all these things evolved gradually, stage by stage. This means that they must have gone through intermediates when they were not a perfect key fitting a lock. So it's easy to open a gradualistic combination lock. And I call this smearing out the luck, because we don't have to get our luck all in one ridiculously large dollop. Instead, we can get our luck in dribs and drabs. If nature is a combination lock, it's a gradualistic combination lock, not an all or nothing one. So the way round the Paley's watch argument is that nature can tinker in a very small way over a long period of time and then achieve a miracles. So in other words, nature can't fashion an eye, but it can bend the rules slowly till it makes an eye. I find this a very weak argument. It's almost as if it's saying, well, the hand is not quicker than the eye, but it's so slow that you can't see it. Gottfried Leibniz said that natura non facet saltus, which means nature never takes jumps or leaps. Everything happens gradually. And this gradualism was an important part of Darwin's theory throughout the 20th century. Neo-Darwinists like Dickie Dawkins claimed that everything happened so slowly, in essence it was a single nucleotide polymorphism, a single genetic change, gene by gene. There was minute changes that then led to incredible organs like the eye. It's very hard for people that have spent years and years in biology to hear now that 
the prime example given for Darwinian gradualism, the squid's eye, is actually saltation. In previous videos I said how the squid got its eye through horizontal gene transfer all at once. And that's very upsetting to hear that you've been sold a bill of goods in biology class and I got a lot of resistance for that. But I replied in the comments and saw people off uh, who, who were upset to, to hear that really they've been told a lot of nonsense in biology class. But evolution doesn't happen in small increments. And the experiments of Dmitry Balyev were instrumental in showing that in the last century. I really think that the Balyaev experiments was one of the most significant experiments in evolution that took place in the 20th century. The experiment was begun in the 1950s at a fox farm in Siberia. The foxes were being bred for their fur, but they were wild animals that were hard to handle and often too stressed to breed. Balyaev selected foxes by a simple method. He extended a gloved hand into each animal's cage. The foxes that attacked, cowered or bit him, were excluded from breeding. In effect, Belayev was selecting the foxes for their flight distance. Within just 10 years, the selected foxes showed new variety in their color. Some were born with mottled coats or black and white patches. Their ears became floppy. They started to bark. They became highly playful even into adulthood and were no longer afraid of people. Some of the foxes even began to answer to their names. When selection is made for tameness, it impacts on the entire makeup of the animal. Scientists have determined that adrenaline, the fight or flight hormone, and melanin, the skin and fur pigment, are chemically connected, as are the neurotransmitters dopamine and noradrenaline which control behaviors. Affect one system and there is a domino effect from color to behaviors. Belayev had stumbled across the discovery that selecting for the quality of tameness alone could set off a cascade of other changes. Up to that point we all kind of believed Darwin. And Darwin said nature does not go in leaps. Things don't happen fast. They happen gradually. And the answer was, with Belayev's experiment, he was wrong. They do go in leaps, and sometimes big leaps, things that you wouldn't expect. Stephen Jay Gould noticed that the evolutionary record showed that evolutionary change was often static for long periods of time. And then suddenly there was a burst of evolution. He created the theory of punctuated equilibrium to describe how evolutionary change often happened in leaps. Gradualists like Dawkins scathingly referred to Gould's ideas of punctuated evolution as evolution by jerks. To which Gould responded that gradualism was evolution by creeps. I'm an ape. Yeah. Are you Bishop? I'm not. You've got to survive and you may have to be attractive to the opposite sex. A peacock's tail with its eye spots is like a walking neon sign. Neo-Darwinists assume that evolution happens by the slow accumulation of competitive advantages. Sometimes computer programmers use genetic algorithms to, in essence, give a proof of exactly how this mechanism works. Now, having worked a lot with genetic algorithms in my career, I think the exact opposite to what most genetic programmers think, and that's that genetic algorithms are actually a proof against Darwin. And the reason is simple. In any evolutionary program that works with a genetic algorithm, they have something called the fitness function. The way genetic algorithms work is that they have a, a starting population which then gets gradually mutated. Each mutation is tested and the best or fittest of those mutations is then preserved and uh, another generation is generated from the winners in that race. Now, most genetic algorithm programmers assume that this is a kind of proof of Darwinism. In fact, Dickie Dawkins himself in The Blind Watchmaker did exactly that. He wrote programs and showed the results of genetic algorithms to show how Darwinian evolution works. Genetic programs are actually a proof that Darwin was wrong. And the reason is this, that 
every single one of those programs has a breeder function in it. They, it has what's known as a fitness function or a training algorithm at the heart of it. The programmer has to program in what constitutes fitness and apply that as a rule. It basically has a referee to decide who's the most fit. Where's the referee in nature? Now, Darwin spent a lot of time with breeders. In essence, his idea is that nature is breeding itself, just like a cattle breeder. But how can it do that? Where's the breeder in nature? Who's deciding what's fit and what isn't? Where is the fitness function? I don't think there is one. Now you may say, well, hang on, uh, the fitness function is a given. It's, you know, running faster or basically seeing better or hearing better. I say, well, no, that's a subjective evaluation that running faster is actually beneficial. Nature doesn't run tests that way. It seems so logical to our alien cortex and our competitive brain that running faster and seeing better means that obviously you're fitter, you're a better organism and therefore you should only increase. Now to the sort of middling intellect of a neo-Darwinian, that sort of intellectual logical mind worm is very attractive. But hold on a minute and think carefully about it because that's not really how nature works and that's not how thermodynamics works. Things run down, they don't ratchet up. Let me give you this example from personal experience to make you think a little bit about this. So when I was much younger, I was drafted into the South African Air Force and I became an officer. And uh, Now, that was against all odds. When we started off officer training, we were taken from a draft of 3,000 recruits in one intake 500 of those were selected from, for officer training and they were whittled down as we knew they would, were washed out gen over the course of two years training, till eventually there were only six of us that stood on the parade ground and actually got our commissions. Now, does that mean we were the super champions out of those 3,000? No, actually the exact opposite. When we were selected for officer training, on day one of officer training, as cadets do, we kind of had a lottery to see who would make it, knowing that there were exceptionally few would actually get through in the end, far less than 1%. And so we kind of knew each other already from basic training. And there was me and this other guy was really came out the bottom of the heap in the lottery. Nobody thought we would make it through, though both of us did. The reason for it is interesting. Everybody put us at the bottom of the heap because me and my mate didn't have anything going for us. We were just kind of average. And all the other guys that were selected for officer training were, seemed to be kind of supermen. They all had, you know, great fitness function, everything going for them. You know, they guys who looked good and were natural leaders and could run fast, were athletic and, you know, had uber intellects. So it looked like we didn't stand a chance. So how was it that we got through and the supposing Darwinian champions didn't? Well, officer training is an elimination game and I think nature is exactly the same. Nature doesn't select champions, it knocks out flaws. So think of it this way. The reason why these supposedly super Darwinian champions didn't make it to the end of officer training and and pass out and commissioned was because all of them had blind spots and flaws. So you would get a guy who was a natural leader, Steve McQueen, and uh, very physical, but he couldn't remember a list or something that we had to do. All the, all the tests that we had to go through were sudden elimination tests. There were tests of coordination, there were tests of memory, there they were tests of leadership, there were social tests, there were tests of physical fitness. And I didn't excel in any of them, but I didn't suck at any of them either. And every one of these champions had something that they sucked at. And so they were all eliminated. And here the two at the bottom of the pack, me and my mate, were the ones that were selected for officer training. It was this that we didn't have any serious flaws, not that we had fantastic abilities. 
And I think nature is exactly the same way. So don't be so beguiled by things like a fitness function and assuming that nature just is looking for, for champion breeders. It's actually just whittling out anything that has a flaw. Now, if you think about that deeply, that's a serious, serious affront against Darwinian competition and skirts completely round this ridiculous logical mindworm that the fitness must go forward and who is fit is obvious to nature. Fleming Jenkin raised something similar to this argument against Darwinism in what's known as the swamping argument. It's also akin to the dilution argument I mentioned in a previous video. If you remember, it was the specific point in history where Darwin's theory ceased being science and became a faith-based religion. What we're told today by Darwinian apologists is the swamping argument was mostly anchored in the theory of blended inheritance. As the argument goes, since the blended inheritance theory was replaced by Mendelian inheritance in the early 1900s, the swamping argument became obsolete. But nothing of the sort happened. With the Balyeyev experiments, horizontal gene transfer and what we know today about genetics, the swamping argument still sits front and center as the elephant in the room. No one can explain why ACTTG is a beneficial mutation and ACTTA is deleterious. And no one has a theory to explain why deleterious mutations don't always just swamp out beneficial mutations. Which in essence means that Darwin's theory is completely vacuous. How do the beneficial mutations accumulate if it's an elimination contest? So, for example, it doesn't matter if you're an Olympic gold medal swimmer. You don't increase your swimming ability if you eliminated in the morning by slipping on a rock getting into the water or you basically get chased down by a lion on land. All of these things would eliminate you and eliminate your fantastic swimming gene. So you don't get to pass it on if you have some other flaw. So nature is more eliminating flaws than accumulating advantages, which runs contrary to Darwin. If you think about it, Darwin's mechanism falls apart. And competition doesn't hold it together. Obviously, we need to go back to nature and ask ourselves the simple question that Darwin never asked. is saying, if it works like cattle breeders, what in nature is the breeder? Where is the breeder? Now, obviously, there's been an enormous amount of variation, and Darwin was very interested in this, so he spoke to all the leading dog breeders to find out how they generated such diversity. But even they couldn't tell him how it happened in the wild. It seems to me that Darwinists tend to hide behind the circular logic of trite and unscientific truisms. For example, fitness is merely defined as that which makes organisms survive better. They can't even cite a fundamental law of physics or thermodynamics that explains why living things tend to survive better over time and not worse and worse. Minimization of costs should cause a devolution, not evolution. What actually should be happening in nature is not that the antelope that is the fastest in the herd should be a champion that goes on to procreate. It should be that the lion that's chasing the antelope should get slower and slower, the antelope should get fatter and lazier, and the chase should get less and less spectacular to eventually they just collapse into a pool of entropy. How does Darwin's theory relate to the law of gravity, for example, or the law of conservation of energy? They never say. Instead, they seem to adore filling up the cracks with insufferably cute nonsense like, evolution does not have a name, but evolution favors organisms which evolve greater and greater evolvability. Those kind of earworms kind of appeal to them. So when you ask, where's the breeder in nature? They're apt to come up with this sophomoric idea that, well, everything just breeds everything else. Well, what actually happens when you do that? Let's go back to genetic algorithms. What if you get genetic algorithms on a computer and say the fitness function itself, the breeding algorithm, also can breed and mutate? What happens if you make it a free-for-all and say fitness functions themselves can compete against each other? Well, if you try it, you'll find that it all disintegrates into a hot mess. And this is to be expected, because this is straight up thermodynamics, and this is what 
Boltzmann said. Ludwig Boltzmann was an Austrian physicist and philosopher. He believed in atoms at a time when almost no one else did. And he believed in Darwin's theory right at the time when Darwin's theory was eclipsed at the end of the 19th century. That there was no natural order that God had set in stone had already been pointed out by the scientist Boltzmann most admired, Charles Darwin. When Boltzmann was asked how his century would be remembered, he did not choose a physicist. He said it would be the century of Darwin. The physics of Boltzmann's time was still the physics of certainty, of an ordered universe determined from above by predictable and timeless God-given laws. Boltzmann suggested that the order of the world was not imposed from above by God, but emerged from below, from the random bumping of atoms, a radical idea at odds with his times, but the foundation of ours. Boltzmann's genius was that he could accept probability. This meant he could begin to understand complex phenomena, like fire and water and life, things which traditional physics, the physics of mechanics, never could. But because his solution relied on probability, and probability undermines certainty, no one wanted to hear him. This is Ludwig Boltzmann's grave, and that, carved on it, is the equation which killed him. Well, that might be a bit of a melodramatic exaggeration, but there is an element of truth to it. The equation is all about entropy, and it's no exaggeration that today Boltzmann's body lies rotting in his grave, giving one of the best and most sincere demonstrations of the formula he was famous for. The equation is Boltzmann's entropy formula, and it's all about decay, so it's more than appropriate on his gravestone. Boltzmann saw in his kinetic theory of gases that there was a logarithmic connection between entropy and probability. The amount of entropy in a closed system S is equal to Boltzmann's constant K, which is the average kinetic energy of particles in a gas relative to the gas's thermodynamic temperature, times the natural logarithm of all the permutations of those gas particles in space. Think of it roughly as a precise measure of carnage during social unrest. Chaos on the streets of the U.S. Capitol, with protesters smashing windows, blocking traffic, and clashing with police. The K is the number of rioters and how angry they are, and W is all the mess they are liable to create during the riot. The important point is that the chances of them accidentally tidying things up, merely by chance, is very, very low indeed. What Boltzmann had done was formulate exactly the reason for Sadie Connor's iconic second law of thermodynamics. The second law states that there is a natural tendency of any isolated system to degenerate into a more disordered state. The number of ways things can screw up are almost infinitely more than the ways they can get better. Boltzmann had, in essence, captured mortality in an equation. Not surprisingly, this depressed Boltzmann to the point of despair. In 1906, Boltzmann came here to Duino with his wife and daughter on holiday. Exhausted and demoralized, his ideas still not accepted. While they were out walking, he killed himself and left no note of explanation. Now, creationists often claim that Darwin runs contrary to the second law of thermodynamics. And I agree with them. It absolutely does. There's no way that things can ratchet up so you can climb Mount Probable any more than making photocopies of photocopies gets better and better. They get worse over time, not better. Unless there's a fitness function or a breeding algorithm, genetic algorithms don't get better. They deteriorate, according to Boltzmann's law. What Darwinists latch onto, and what biologists are taught to say when confronted with the second law of thermodynamics as an objection to Darwinism, is this tiny detail in Boltzmann, that Boltzmann systems are closed systems. And so they say, well, natural systems are open. Nature and the biosphere is an open system. This is absolutely wrong. 
If you talk to a physicist, they will clear that up for you. Biologists are talking absolute poppycock. Nature is a closed system. The biosphere is closed. And if you doubt that, then ask yourself, why does it take millions and millions of dollars to get even a kilogram of weight into space and out of the biosphere? The biosphere is effectively closed. If you speak to a genuine physicist and not a biologist, they will tell you that a simple bucket like this, out in the sun, filled with water, is effectively a thermodynamically closed system. And so is the biosphere. So this is complete nonsense, this argument that somehow the biosphere is open, therefore it doesn't fall under Boltzmann's law. If that's true of a bucket of water, how much more so of Darwin's famous warm little pond where he theorised life started? So how do we address Boltzmann's law? Clearly, nature has developed complexity in defiance of Boltzmann. Well, unfortunately, after challenging one of our cultural icons like Darwin, I'm now forced into confronting one of the icons of physics, and that's Boltzmann. Unfortunately, Boltzmann also was wrong. I first learned about Boltzmann and the second law of thermodynamics in high school, and the moment I heard about his theory of entropy, I immediately thought he must surely be wrong. The reason was that only the day before being introduced to Boltzmann, our physics teacher had shown us a glass tube full of ball bearings in order to demonstrate the kinetic theory of ideal gases. What had impressed me was that after you shook the glass tube, the ball bearings immediately came to rest under the force of gravity in self-organized patterns and domains like this. How could that possibly happen if everything was supposed to proceed inexorably towards greater and greater entropy or disorder? My physics teacher couldn't answer, and eventually she just resorted to saying, look, that's what the book says, so if you don't answer it that way in the exam, you'll just be marked down. And that's how I learnt about academia. I thought Boltzmann had clearly got only half the story. He was really a glass-half-full kind of guy. When he got really depressed, even his associates pointed out to him that his theory could not be the whole truth, because there was order all around us in the world. But he dismissed them and stuck to his theory that, in the end, everything could be modelled as an ideal gas. So everything dissipated and decayed. Boltzmann was thinking about his atoms as Newtonian billiard balls bouncing off each other and diffusing over space forever. He seems to have forgotten all the attractive forces that atoms and molecules are subject to. Molecules don't just dissipate and disperse with heat. Attractive forces like van der Waals and other electrostatic forces are also pulling them together. Gravity in the shape of ball bearings in the model also pull things together, and in doing so they create order out of chaos. The planets themselves are spherical and highly ordered, and as far as we know, they were created out of diffused gases, plasmas, the very things that Boltzmann said should have become more and more disordered over time. But they didn't. The third law of thermodynamics states that as the temperature of a system approaches absolute zero, all processes cease and the entropy of the system approaches a minimum value. As you lower the temperature, everything should become more or less a perfect crystal, which is in accordance with Boltzmann's law. But by a different token, as planets like ours coalesced from gas, against all probability they became hotter and more spherical and more ordered, contrary to Boltzmann's law. It's often said that entropy is like dropping an egg on the floor. Once you do it, supposedly you'll never get it back together again. It's not a time-reversible process. But that's not really true. In space it may well return to a form much like the egg it once was due to electrostatic forces, chemical bonds and gravity. Attractive forces like that. Don't forget how attractive forces form the capsid in a virus. Boltzmann and Darwin were wrong. Einstein said about thermodynamics, It is the only physical theory of universal content which I am convinced that within the framework of applicability of its basic concepts will never be overthrown. If Einstein said that, then you can bet it's almost certainly wrong. The primary thing that neo-Darwinists and Boltzmann and his contemporaries got wrong was they thought of complex systems as essentially linear. 
There were stochastic underneath, but in that stochastic cloud that you could make some determinations. They didn't understand that nature and complex systems are actually non-linear. A selfish gene is a very linear idea, and so is Darwin's theory. But anybody that has some familiarity with complex systems know that they have discontinuities, they have dramatic phase changes and tipping points. That's what you can see in things like punctuated evolution. Jensen's inequality states that the average of a function is not the function of the average, and that increases with disorder. You can't generalize from knowledge of the parts, and neither can nature. And single genetic changes and mutations are a part. You can't generalize averages from them. What makes nature nonlinear is self-interaction. Self-interaction is the self-organizing principle that Boltzmann neglected. Take for example this self-interacting soliton, a smoke ring. This is something that Boltzmann predicted could never exist. But even a dolphin could have told him otherwise. Now, in the next episode, I promise to give you an alternative theory to Darwin's theory, a theory that's testable and falsifiable. And unlike Darwin's theory, it's not just faith-based. Rapid increase in population, which inevitably would lead to competition.